allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Mrs. Treadway, if you would do the roll call, please. Nina Dingen. Here. Kate Mayer. Here. Tim Menninger. Here. Myself here. Brianna Schwabenbauer. Here. Gary Dunlop. Here. Joe Gittins. Here. And Cheryl Hancock. Here. Thank you. With seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. I would note that we are going to move up item 9.3 um, to the beginning of the reports and discussion period if you so approve, but I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Okay, seeing no one come forward, then I would move on to recognition and thank you. National AgriScience Teacher of the Year recognition, um, Dr. Carlson. And I would invite Mr. Roger King up to the side table, and as Mr. King makes his way up, um, it's, again, we, we found out back, I think, in August, uh, Roger, that of your award, and we had shared that, and what just wonderful news, and so well-deserved tonight. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to make some comments, but more importantly, I think you have a presentation that you're going to want to make as well tonight. What would you like to do first, Mr. King? Uh, talk a little bit, or would you like to do? Um, I would like to just present, and then after that, if you give me a few minutes, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. I would ask Ms. Principal, Mr. Bear, and Board President, Ms. Hancock, uh, to join you around the front. As a result, um, I, I had the honor of being selected as uh, National Agri-Science Teacher of the Year. Um, that it is related to obviously the world of ag education. And as a result of that, there's a lot of sponsorship that happens throughout the world of agriculture. And on behalf of the sponsor, and additionally to a anonymous donation from a community member in Holman, um, we have been awarded $2,000 to be put into the budget in my curriculum area for the purpose of enhancing the agri-science curriculum that we currently have. So I'm gonna present that check to the Board of Education and uh, appreciate you allowing me to. One more? <laughs> Gotta make sure I have two. I would like to take a little bit of time and at least share some things about the agri-science department because um, needless to say, it's obviously we're in a big district, we have a lot of curriculum areas and if I could have a little bit of chance to share a few things. So I created a little handout in regards to the program information and um, or so if we can just kind of pass one down and um, Thank you. I think and I'll just go through that a little bit. In addition, I have another handout in regards to the um, organization that um, I advise with the FFA and I think there's some relevance to that and we'll talk a little bit about what's here and kind of go from there. So um, as far as the agri-science curriculum is concerned, um, we've done a lot of things over the years and I think um, I've had the honor to be selected to do a lot of different things throughout the state and I, obviously that's highlighted um, on the bottom half of that page. And it's provided me a lot of opportunity to put forth what the School District of Homan does, but at the same time um, share with people both nationally and, and statewide and um, regionally what we do in ag education. 
currently I serve on the state standards team and in developing the state standards and we talk continuously about where we are in ag education in regards to the common core standards, to the, um, all the standards that are out there. We currently are working on a um, equivalency um, connection to all the common core standards. Uh, we're gonna publish ours in June of, um, of this year as a state standards team and we'll be rolling that out at our professional development conference and they've asked me to present on the animal science side of things a workshop on how we take those standards and put them into an authentic look in the classroom. Um, part of that is obviously as I tell my students I've been here long enough that you can probably call me you know old as dirt kind of thing but at the same time it gives me some experience in, in dealing with a lot of different things that are out there. Um, to share with with um, with the board some other kind of things that we do in the district you can see the course offerings that we have that there are a variety of course offerings that reflect hopefully on the interest of students in the school district uh, we are not um, we are blessed with a lot of agrarian space but not a lot of people that are dealing with the agricultural community directly um, and so that kind of you know causes some degree of you know can you attract a student in those kind of things um, we do focus on their interest, obviously related to the food, food fiber, natural resource interest industry. Um, I was a little bit wa late walking in because I was talking with a student in regards to um, what kind of fertilizer are we going to put in the hydroponic system in the greenhouse, and is it going to increase the pH level based on the kind of fertilizer that's the nitrogen that's going to be uptake by the plant? You know, so those are the kind of things that we look at and. We are challenging ourselves with a lot of different things. So we are going to look for the board support in creating an equivalency credit in the agri, agri, uh, in the agri science courses. Um, that should be on, um, on the works uh, as quick as we can go. Um, and hopefully that's done before the summer is out. We do have three classes that offer uh, college credit, which I, um, I think is an awesome opportunity for students. Uh, those college credits um, based on the university system the, uh, I'm hired as a, or work as a university or technical school instructor, and that course is taught in their curriculum outcome. And then if a student was to enroll in that class and transfer to a four-year degree uh, program, that could transfer directly to a four-year program. So a lot of benefits to students, so we can take nine college credits out of the program to that area. Um, we are using technology in the program. We have a wireless lab. We'll probably turn that over to the other side just to kind of move along a little bit. We do have a wireless lab in our, in our um, department that's been there for three, four years, I think, at this point. We have a greenhouse, and we are going to look at the aquaponics part of things, growing plants with the production of fish. Um, also, we are currently, we took the greenhouse that we had now, and we are trying to work with the farm to school program and grow uh, vegetables, specifically lettuce, through hydroponics. I'm amazed at the interest in that, and it looks like we'll probably be changing a little bit of direction in the sense of trying to take and look at homeowner size ki uh, model in there so people can look at it for use there. Um, short discussion today about shouldn't we maybe have one of those in all the elementary schools. Is it the way to go? I'm not sure, but I think it's um, much different than growing uh, flowers and something from the landscape side of things. Uh, we do push uh, or look at strands in curriculum, both leadership, animal, plant, and environmental resources. A lot of hands-on education. Uh, you can see some of the labs there. <laughs> Part of the ag education model is to take and look at the uh, agricultural ex supervised ag experience, uh, which we try to work with students to take and create a real hands-on um, interest year-round, uh, owning animals, working with local businesses, uh, what have you. I think I signed an agreement today with a student working at Farm and Fleet because she's been hired as an assistant manager in the gardening area. We're hoping what we provide them gets those, those jobs. You know, 17, 18 year old student to do that I think is a pretty um, awesome experience for them. Um, so a lot of different experiences that students have there. Um, we also have uh, an FFA program, and you can see the kind of things that we do there. Just to highlight a few things last year, uh, we took third place last year out of 250 chapters in the parliamentary procedure contest. So it's amazing to me when you take and bring a meeting to order how my mind works in relation to everyone else's. Um, <laughs> so um, today I had a student come in and said, Mr. King, you sure they could have stopped debate by just a majority vote? 
No, they couldn't did that, but if they did, um, you know, I'm just not sure if they should. So those are the kind of things you look at and you go from there. So um, we also have uh, gold rated, um, we're a gold rated chapter. There's 250 ch uh, chapters in the state and they rank, you, rank gold, silver, bronze, and um, uh, participant, I believe, and we're a gold rated chapter. Um, we also have different degree levels and you see some of the s numbers of students there. We also have a state agri-science fair um, we also have students that uh, participate in a variety of things, and if you look there, um, I did want to highlight, we have one of our students that sang uh, at the National FFA conference. There's 50,000 people that attend there. Uh, he had an opportunity to audition at our, our national conference and uh, sing there. So um, that, I think, is an awesome experience for students. Uh, Dale Carnegie, we have students that are involved in Dale Carnegie. I don't know if there's any graduates on the board that are from Dale, Dale, the Dale Carnegie um, School of... Um, of the introductory course that um, Terry uh, Siebert uh, does in the lacrosse area. We certainly have students that do that. Um, they give us um, two scholarships to, to two of our FFA leaders each spring and fall um, to obviously increase their leadership ability in the class. Um, we also um, have a um, steak and bean scholarship activity. We try to really push scholarship. It's your GPA goes up from first term to second term, you get a steak dinner. If it goes down, you eat beans. <laughs> so it really kind of works there. And you can also see we do collaborate with a lot of other people uh, in the district and so on. I've kind of coined one thing that I think is really true and what's the one high school's best kept secret? The agri-science department. So it's just a quick little rundown of what we do and hopefully um, um, I can continually to, um, you know, do the job that's, uh, on a, garnered by the board to obviously provide a quality education to the students at Holman and uh, I enjoy uh, what I do. It's, it's fun to come to work every day and um, barring the fact sometimes I have to put a pair, second pair of socks on. <laughs> but beyond that it's pretty good. So, uh, But all in all I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to speak uh, on behalf of the Ag Education pro Program and uh, stop in and see what we do once in a while. So appreciate that. Thanks. Well, thank you and on behalf of the board I would just like to say thank you Roger for all that you do I think I would disagree just a little about the best kept secret oftentimes when I travel um, and talk with folks and they ask where I'm from I say home and and they are very aware of your program it has a very wonderful reputation statewide and nationally now and you certainly have brought a lot of um, quality and excellence to the district and we thank you for that and congratulations on your well-deserved recognition well that's exciting national recognition it's very nice next is our visit with state senator jennifer schilling so if you come forward jennifer and as she's doing that, I would just make a couple introductory comments. Um, it is our practice of our school district to invite <coughs> in our representatives, state representatives. I know S Steve Doyle is, we're working on scheduling him to come in next. Um, and we so appreciate your, your time to share with us what's happening in Madison and maybe some thoughts on K-12 education. Um, and then... I'll provide a few minutes for Q&A back from the board. Sure. Well, good evening. Is this the right microphone I'm supposed it to is, use? It is, yes. Okay. All right, good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the second time I've uh, been up here appearing before the board for kind of a linkage or a dialogue about what's happening. And certainly, as we are still in the honeymoon phase of this legislative session, we were just sworn in uh, last Monday, um, we have a lot of tough, tough issues for us uh, to be tackling. The first one will certainly be the, the state budget that tomorrow night the governor uh, will have his state of the state address, which is kind of looking, he'll be highlighting um, the last two years under his watch and his administration, uh, the effects of his budget, uh, and also looking ahead and kind of setting the table for that um, budget address, which is scheduled for February 12th. And as I have attended meetings with the governor and he's done his work <coughs> with Walker, uh, you know, the areas that I think he will be hitting on uh, will be uh, the economy and jobs, workforce development, um, transforming education, uh, government efficiencies, and um, um, infrastructure uh, investment, so roads, bridges, as well as broadband uh, around the state. Um, but as we look at um, the last budget and the impact that it had on education, 
Um, Wisconsin has lost over 2,300 school staff positions across the state. 73% uh, of Wisconsin school districts have lost teachers, and the number of students per teacher in Wisconsin is at a 10-year high. Uh, fewer teachers mean larger class sizes and less one-on-one -on -one time with our students. So as we look to the next budget, and I know uh, Superintendent Evers has um, put out his fair funding for our future, which I think that is a, a good start to look at um, ways to reform our broken school funding formula. Um, although I, I get the sense that when um, Governor Walker talks about reforming education, he is looking at expanding uh, the, the voucher program in the state, and I find that troubling. Uh, we've already expanded it beyond the Milwaukee public school system to Milwaukee County and also the Racine School District. Green Bay was kind of that next a school district that was kind of on the horizon and we had um, legislation at the end at kind of the 11th hour that we closed that um, that loophole to allow it to expand there but that's I've heard that um, at several meetings that I've been at that that's part of the area that they're looking at and again I I find that troubling it's not the same kind of accountability or standards or testing measures uh, that that are needed um, so we'll have to certainly take a look at that and listen carefully as the governor talks about uh, his idea for the budget um, there also there was a private school voucher bill for special education students that was introduced last session um, it really lacked the necessary oversight to make those students um, properly educated and, and cared for uh, there were no mandates to ensure that the, that the child would be taught by a certified special ed teacher or related services um, personnel if needed so again I think we're gonna see additional language additional bills on those measures um, again, taking away some of that, those um, public dollars for our public schools and channeling them into those voucher programs. Um, as we look at the budget, and I'm pleased to be reappointed to the Joint Finance Committee. I am one of two senators that will be serving on the Finance Committee. The makeup is 12 Republicans and four senators, uh, or, yeah, or four Democrats, 12 Republicans and four Democrats. Um, myself and Senator Bob Wirch from the southeastern part of the state will be uh, my colleague. And then on the assembly side, we've got a representative from Racine and from Milwaukee. So I think it's really important, and I've told my colleagues in our caucus that certainly I represent western Wisconsin, but as you are only one of two legislators, your lens is the whole statewide as you look at the state uh, and, and those public policies and those issues. As we look at that state budget, Restoring the school safety levy limit exemption, certainly after the tragedy in Connecticut that, that school safety has been on people's radar, people are talking about that. Um, that, that there's been some talk um, just within the last couple days about restoring that school safety limit, uh, uh, levy limit exemption to allow districts to raise $100 per student for things like security officers, for door lock systems, for anti-bullying efforts uh, mm -hmm. and programs. Um, in the last, uh, it was eliminated, that, that uh, the Republicans eliminated that exemption last year, but they retained the energy efficiency exemption, if you recall that. Mm -hmm. Now, Senator Olson, who has been the chair of the Education um, Committee in the Senate, has said he would be open to considering an exemption for school safety in the wake of uh, Sandy Hook Elementary. However, Assembly Speaker Robin Voss has said he would oppose bringing back that exemption. So we will see, as it often is, um, the two houses kind of have to get together and, and figure out where they're going to meet in the middle or there's going to be some t give and take and some compromise on and things but this is very early on uh, as we look at uh, the budget so we'll have to keep our eye on that the other one that i've been following closely is the per pupil funding increase and senator olson has again indicated that he would like to increase that uh, 200 dollars per student uh, increase in school funding each of the next two years uh, which would boost money available to districts by about $510 million over the biennium. However, and there's always a however when you're working with the legislature, uh, he would support increasing the state aid by only about $300 million, and the rest would have to be uh, come from local property taxes. And so again, looking to local government, looking to our school boards and those tough decisions and discussions that have to happen in communities like Holman all over the, across the state. Uh, Superintendent Tony Evers has proposed increasing the, revi the revenue limit uh, by $225 per student uh, next year and $230 in the second year. So we will see what happens uh, um, in February as, as that lens on the budget becomes more in focus. 
he also <coughs> proposed increasing state aid by $615 million, which would keep property taxes flat under those revenue uh, limit uh, increases. Uh, I know we've backed away from our two-thirds commitment, and that's uh, funding schools, and, and I certainly am looking to see what happens with, with that, that I think as the state should return to our two-thirds commitment of funding our schools. Um, as, and as I travel throughout the, the Senate district, it's made up of half of Monroe County, La Crosse, Vernon, and, and Crawford County, and many of those small rural school districts that they've got declining enrollment, that they have growing transportation costs, that there are technology and, and internet challenges as well. Um, so we need to be investing and in working with my colleagues uh, as kind of an agenda for our rural schools as well. Um, also, uh, with the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and that's one that I um, have followed on the finance committee. Uh, that funding was eliminated in the last budget, and um, as I currently sit on the college and workforce readiness committee, a, a committee that Tim Sullivan, a private citizen, has chaired, that we're looking at career pathways to school, to our technical colleges, to, to the workplace, and as we had many employers come in and they talked about that STEM curriculum and, and, and making sure that we invest in that and making sure that the students are up to par on that. So we'll be looking to see what happens there. Um, the other committees that I serve on is government operations, public works, and telecommunications. And uh, that's an area as uh, I want to be looking at broadband expansion here in the state and proper bandwidth. And, Last fall, I filled out a, a candidate survey, a, kind of a questionnaire about kind of what were my priorities, and I put down broadband, and the uh, staff over at the Public Service Commission, the next day they called my office and they said, nobody talks about broadband. Senator Schilling is interested in broadband. We'd love to have a meeting with her. We've got maps with pockets of like where we're short in the state, where we're investing. And so I've got all these color-coded maps in my office that they were excited, the staff to come in and, and talk about what they are doing as, a, as a, an agency to look at, you know, proper uh, uh, technology throughout the state. And as we're doing some of these Department of Transportation projects and we've got some road projects and where we can lay that lay down, line down at the same time, be appropriate, be efficient, that we're looking at that. We did have an opportunity for some federal money last year that was um, uh, allocated to the states. Wisconsin would have received about $23 million. Unfortunately, Governor Walker gave that money back to the federal government that was kind of deemed for broadband uh, expansion. So we'll have to see if um, what is in, again, this upcoming budget and what developments are there. But as I travel around to some of these small communities, they say, Senator Schilling, we still have dial-up. Nobody mm. chooses dial-up in this day and age, and as we are working either you know within local units of government or local units of government or as entrepreneurs like that's just frustrating that we need to kind of be up to snuff with those technologies and many of um, or at least two hospitals in the Senate district are looking at new medical centers or new hospitals in Prairie du Chien and Hillsboro and electronic medical records proper bandwidth but of course our schools our libraries and those areas that we need to make sure that we're kind of on that uh, internet uh, super highway in an appropriate way. Um, uh, I think maybe that's kind of it where I can take questions there, kind of a, an overview, a snapshot of what's happening over the next six months. Um, <coughs> right now we're waiting for final numbers to come in at the end of January from our fiscal bureau, our kind of nonpartisan accountants. Uh, right now they're estimating we'll have about $348 million to the good that we will end uh, the last biennium with with projected new revenue of $1.5 million over the two years. However, um, the agencies have $1.7 million in requests. So like every governor, they're gonna have to have to pare down his administration that never, an agency never receives everything that they ask for on that wish list and uh, they'll have to see, we'll have to see what happens there. Um, I will say last fall, I was here on a Friday night at a, the football game. It was uh, pork for education, pork feet for education. It was a cold, blustery uh, Friday night, but it was nice to be up here and visit with people in the tent and uh, shake hands and uh, talk to people about things going on here in the community. Um, and then probably six weeks ago, I was also invited by uh, the teachers here at the high school um, in the special ed department to job shadow two students at um, Features. and. Um, that was really fun to get to know those uh, two students and the manager there at Features and the great partnership that's been uh, put together and, and uh, cemented with the school district here and with other employers and businesses in the, in the community. Um, and I, I told the teachers that I'm really glad that in these tight budget times that 
the school district here in Holman has continued to see the value in making those connections in job skills and partnering in within the community. So that was a fun night and I said I'd be back with my family one night and I would look for those two bussers to be out there busy and the customers there, they come in on Fridays and they are always looking for those two young men there and, and converse with them and so that was a, a nice night to be out there and I said I'll be back and uh, they were doing a good job. I didn't want to take them away from their job too long, but I was really glad that the teachers and that those students had reached out to me and asked me to come up and see what they do to, again, reiterate the importance of uh, these programs in, in the schools and what the school district here is doing right. So thank you. Well, thank you. Any questions for Senator Schilling? I had a couple, but you answered them as you went along. I said, Robin Voss, nope, then you answered that. <laughs> Luther Olson, you answered that. And then you talked about the school safety and um, nope. Thank you, Jennifer. Any comments, questions? Um, yeah, I do. Um, just a thank you, because I notice a lot in the news that you do reach out to your little communities and, and for you to visit features and still with your busy political schedule. I really appreciate that in, in our representatives. So thanks for that, for getting to know the little people that you represent. Um, this coming week, Dale, or Dr. Carlson and I are going to the WASB State Convention, and I know one of their resolutions also talks about um, opposing the use of federal and state tax monies to subsidize um, non-public schools and um, voucher systems and things like that. And and I often look at WASB. WASB sometimes it, you get both sides of the story, I think, in WASB, and that's a good place to look if they're opposing something like that. Um, Again, thanks for being a watchdog on that issue, and, and maybe the leverage of WASB can help with that, mm -hmm. um, with that resolution going through. Um, the other thing I wanted just to talk about a little bit is I know that you're involved with, um, which committee is it that focuses on the skills gap that you're so involved with, or did you just have a recent? Uh, that, that is the College and Workforce Readiness, but I also serve on Colleges and Universities, which is a standing committee within okay. the Senate. So that whole issue right now, you know across the country, we're dealing as with school boards and our staff with common core curriculum standards and upping the ante in how we teach our children. Um, and I just think that that's so important in looking at the budget cuts that education had in the last budget. Uh, there, were, there were major guts that went on. And I have heard a little bit um, from our governor and from both sides that there could be some some refunding to make up for those gaps but i haven't read any specifics at all but as we look at how education is changing when we look at what we need to work on in education which is upping how we teach in tech schools <laughs> which were also gutted a lot last year um, and in how are how many teachers we can hire you talked about the class size and what that means um, I just want to reiterate thank you for anything you can do to support giving back some of those monies. Um, I, I don't always know that people who aren't in the educational field, I don't know if they know how big these changes are and economically how much they impact mm -hmm. what a school district must provide for its kids. So. Yeah, so I'm hopeful that we can narrow the skills gap in the... Uh, in the, this session, as we look at programs and invest in you know si sound investments, there certainly I don't think the technical schools will see a cut as they did in the last budget of about 72 million dollars. Um, but they have waiting lists and some of these high demand um, programs and skills. And if it's in nursing or welding and some of the other manufacturing and what we can do to kind of have that pipeline of making sure that. Uh, you know, people have access into our tech schools that they don't have these waiting line uh, waiting lists that they can then get out into the workforce. We have like 44,000 jobs right now that are open on the workforce development website, and we just need a better alignment of kind of what employers are looking for here in the I state. I think did I read something like 10,000 or 12,000 students are on a waiting list for the top priority tech school jobs but because their budgets were cut there are no openings yeah. is, have I got that right and so that impacts our seniors <coughs> yeah. every year that that want to go to our tech schools it just seems and if the if our small businesses want those fields filled it seems like a no-brainer to fund yeah. this state so we can get a job force yeah. going the other thing on, on that college and workforce readiness was um, 
really the emphasis of that career pathway, kind of a review annually with students. And they said, you know, sometimes we need to do it before high school, that we need in our middle schools, look to see and expose our students to careers uh, and skills that are out there and to do a better job of partnering up with, with employers through youth apprenticeship programs and kind of get that on that, get them on the right pathway. Now, I, I, was, I changed my major when I was a sophomore in college, so you can't always say, well, four years, you know what you're going to do the day that you, you know, walk through those doors and college and higher education is an opportunity to kind of explore and have a lot of things opened up to you. But if we can, you know, find that there are students who maybe pay tuition for three semesters to a university and they say, really, I wanted to go, to, I, tech school is better for me and I wish I would have known this earlier and explored those pathways and looked at those skills and the training necessary, um, if we can, you know, try to get them on that right path. But I know we'll never, you know, you, we'll never do 100% because you always want those, those people kind of exploring what's on the horizon. Plus, in this day and age, there are jobs that, you know, aren't even around and invented yet that students graduated or freshmen in college will probably go out and work in that workforce four years from now too. So. Yep. And it's just the changing of, you know, you talk about manufacturing and you have the stereotypical idea of what that means. And in today's world, manufacturing, it's a clean job, it's technology based, mm -hmm. it's, it's very different than what manufacturing might have been when I was in high school and considering a, you know, a, a program for after. So I think that's getting at that, that we need to help our young people early on um, understand what are the uh, all of the possibilities. Do you uh, have the youth apprenticeship program? Is that a strong program here within Holman? I think it's the youth apprenticeship. I know some school districts. I think we've been up and down with that. Okay. I know we've done some CNA stuff previously and then some automotive sorts of things and it I just haven't seen as much information on that. In we, are, we have room for growth. Okay. <laughs> Well, and then I also would like to thank you for coming. I know, Jen, you mentioned earlier the, the area that you cover, and a lot of those school districts are seeing um, decreasing enrollments, and Holman is unique mm -hmm. and a little different. Mm -hmm. And that increasing enrollment, while it does bring more state aid to us, it also does provide challenges. And I always want to remind people of that because the decreasing, there's a lot of attention paid to that and I understand that. It's just because they have five less students doesn't mean their costs for lighting the buildings go down. Us, we are, we constantly and continually get pushed for our capacity of our buildings and those sorts of things and I've just said this in the past, you know, considering that educating K-12 students until they're 21 is a constitutional expectation and maybe the state could consider supporting those building needs that would take two dollars off of our mill rate um, if we didn't have the debt that we have based on um, having to build new buildings and so you know creative creatively maybe there's some things that you could look at because a statewide not just for us but right. for other that much like what UW system does when they build new buildings educational buildings they need to come to the, the legislature to get those done but if there would be ways that we could put more of our local dollars into the educational programs and those other things that are required um, could be done at the state mm -hmm. level just well, I, and I'm f we're fortunate in western Wisconsin and you know many communities around the state that they strongly support their schools that their identity is that as their community is tied to their schools and the success of their schools um, I was reminded of that uh, in May when I spoke. I was a commencement speaker at Wazika Steuben High School, and it was a graduating class of 22, including <laughs> three foreign students, foreign exchange students. Uh, and I was impressed where, you know, we had a slideshow of every high school student, so I knew what they looked like as a baby, and then their senior graduating picture. I knew where they were all going to school, many of them going to Southwest Tech, some were going to diesel and mechanic school in Chicago. Um, but then just the local level of community support for scholarships for those students. And it was, uh, you know, private citizens who had been successful in their business uh, and in their life that wanted to give back to that community. There were, there were others. And I, as I sat there in, in the gym, I was really impressed by this small community um, who could probably be sucked up by some, you know, greater school district like Prairie du Chien just down the road, but uh, that they were alive and well and thriving and they wanted to make sure that Senator Jennifer Schilling knew that we've already consolidated, we have already combined with Steuben, and so we're Wazika Steuben and we are 22 <laughs> seniors strong and that we value education, but we need a little help and we need some flexibility on, on what we're doing down here in our little corner of the world.
and we really have been blessed by great community support for that but mm -hmm. as the economy turns hopefully it's turning for the better but when it was it was a mm -hmm. it's a difficult for our people so just something to keep in mind so thank you if there aren't any other questions um, then thank you very much for yes and thank yeah. you for all you do and please know my door is always open uh, as we have uh, the upcoming budget uh, discussions um, things will be happening probably faster you know quicker in, in June and July when we're actually debating it but as we're putting this together I'm hopeful that we can have a hearing here in Western Wisconsin on the budget two years ago that was moved to Nina unfortunately so hopefully we can have citizens can have their say but please know that my door is always open and if it's easier to meet back here and have a cup of coffee and stop at the office I'm willing to do that but when you come to Madison please come and see me in 20 south on the ground floor of the state capitol <laughs> thank you very much okay then moving on to reports and discussions uh, pupil services anticipated oh I'm sorry we're going to move the community collaboration venture up since we have some guests and Jennifer if you want to listen to this next thing it's kind of an exciting opportunity Dr. Carlson well as Lori Kessler Marilyn Wershoven and Dan McHugh make their way up I just want to thank these three I've had the opportunity of recently meeting with them learning more uh, the exciting I think information you're going to find in a few minutes and so my <clears throat> my purpose here is to be very brief I want to remind us of our vision of educating every student to prepare them for a global for global success and I think what you're going to hear tonight fits aligns uh, right on with that vision you know we have needs I think they're going to talk about um, the needs not only that we meet during the day but those needs of our kids outside the day and within our community. And in order for our kids to fully reach that success, to be out, to be competitive out in the global society, we need to pay attention to that. And so tonight, the outcome, the objective that I know these three, and you might see some other familiar faces out in the audience that I think are here um, specific to this project, but the outcome or the, uh, the hope is that the board in many ways can lead um, by example, by giving them the thumbs up consensus to continue to explore partnerships. You're going to hear that, I think you may recall Lori was here within the past year and we've heard she's reminded us often about the needs of our kids and um, so tonight as you they're going to present as you have an opportunity to ask questions make comments um, I know they would appreciate and ask um, for you to say um, whether you have concerns whether your support but that consensus this is not an action item but it is something that they want to leave here tonight with being able to move forward even this week in having continue having their conversations within our community and beyond okay. so Lori. Thank, thank you as you know as Dale said over the course of the past several years I've had the occasion to speak with you all regarding the needs of the young people in our community most of you also know that for the last seven years I've been the chairperson of the Holman Area Partnership for Youth whose mission has been to bring a full-time youth center to the community of Holman in fact, I've made my pitch to this very group several times before, emphasizing my belief that the hurting and vulnerable kids I work with each day deserve to have a safe and productive place to go during the after school and evening hours. By my side has been a small but dedicated group of people who have worked diligently to try to provide the programs that our young people need to keep them healthy and safe during this very critical time. Through the generosity of Holman Lutheran Church and the Boys and Girls Club, we were able to serve close to 100 young people two nights a week for almost four years. Last year, we outgrew this space and were forced to close our doors and look elsewhere to find a way to serve these young people who have proven our case. The community needs somewhere for them to go. Last April at the Holman Foundation breakfast, I finally had to acknowledge that we were not finding the answers we were looking for. I made an impassioned plea for anyone to join me in the hopes of creating a partnership that was desperately needed to move our cause forward. If you remember, I came here too to ask all of you that very same thing. Fortunately for me, <coughs> someone answered my call, and that person was longtime Holman supporter and recent alumni award winner, Mr. Dan McHugh. 
Dan then brought another Holman mover and shaker on board and the person of Ms. Mary, Mary Lynn Worshoven. And for the past nine months, the three of us have been working hard to find a way to create a sustainable program for our teens. Together, we've done our homework. We've done extensive research to seek ideas for programs. We've visited other youth sites. We've broadened our understanding of the creative ways other communities have met these needs. And we've also taken the time to hold conversations with many individuals in the area to help us understand what it would take to create what we hope will become a model for other communities. We aren't experts in teen programming or teen mental health, but we knew of the success of the community center operated by the YMCA in La Crosse. Our conversations with the YMCA have allowed us to build a relationship with them that will continue to be one that we can use for guidance and direction. They boast that is their relationship and partnership with Gunderson Lutheran's behavioral health specialist that has allowed them to provide quality programs for all use, but targets an often overlooked population, teens with mental health needs and kids that find it hard to fit in anywhere. Gunderson Lutheran and the YMCA have already indicated a strong interest in assisting us in providing programming to serve the kids in our community as well. The YMCA has also expressed an interest in providing program to the community beyond the teen programming. Somewhere along the way, what started as an initial idea to bring a teen center to town became something greater that involved looking at the needs of not just the adolescent population, but the needs of our entire community. For us, it became a vision that might look something like this. Imagine a place that served our school district by day and our youth after school and in the evening. Now toss in some programming that combines the needs of our community and the needs of our kids. Next, think about a place that invites intergener intergenerational activities and services that will benefit the whole community. These visions became a springboard for encouraging us to think outside the box, to find ways to connect the dots in an effort to get a variety of organizations working together to successfully meet those needs. And that's when things got really fun. <laughs> Dan, Mary Lynn, and I set up several meetings with local agencies to explore interests in a project that involves shared vision, shared ownership, and shared services. And we need to let you know that to say these meetings were successful would be an understatement. This concept was welcomed and supported by everyone we spoke with. And we heard things like, this is the most exciting idea I've ever seen, or this is exactly the way we should be doing things. Because we're still in the concept stage, we are not able to talk about specifics tonight, so we don't have any answers to how everything will work or how it might all play out. But we're coming to you tonight because naming the school district as an official partner in this project is critical to our success. We all know that schools are the heart of any healthy community. We know that schools are first and foremost about kids, and we know that the school district of Holman has a history of doing what's right. We also know that if kids are gonna truly be successful, we must support them beyond what happens between the hours of 7.30 and 3. So tonight, we are asking that you commit to the idea of not just being a partner, but joining us as a leader in a venture that will serve the entire community. Right now, you're probably asking yourselves, well, what does that really mean? <laughs> And that's a fair question. Plainly put, to be successful, this project needs physical space and purposeful programming. So tonight, we're asking you to consider two things. Your consensus to allow us to continue conversations with potential partners who may share the same visions for our teens in our community. And number two, to include in those conversations the ability to consider potential use of school properties that would not impede future growth or planning of the school district. As in all things, timing is everything, and we believe that now is the time to move forward. We only wish you could have heard and appreciated all of the enthusiastic re responses we have heard. So tonight, we're seeking your enthusiasm. A commitment to this vision will allow us to continue conversations as we meet with public and private partners for financial support in an effort to map out more specific details as we hear the voices of all involved. 
We know we don't have all the answers right now, but if you can make this commitment, we will, of course, keep you informed. As we grow this dream, we believe that we'll be able to solidify the programs, facility plans, operating costs, and additional contingencies. Our community has the opportunity to lead the way and be a model for others as we pursue this unique and collaborative venture. And the words of Mr. Dan McHugh, we're going to make this happen. <laughs> and I think we will. In my heart, I know we will. So. Thank you. Mr. McHugh, did you have anything to say? Uh, well, when she says we're going to make this happen, we're definitely going to do it. Two people in the institute, can you hear me? It's for the audience, the TV audience, too, so uh, the mic. Two people that we can, is it on? Yep. That we can mention that are on board is I happen to know Jerry Arndt very well at Gunderson Lutheran. Um, we've been actually, as our company, been working there on that site for four years. And when we, the three of us, presented this thing to them, um, he was just, he was ready to go. He, Gunderson Lutheran will be a partner in this project. And then the next step we kept going, we can mention this, this individual in this uh, business is, uh, I think everybody here knows Mr. Bill Soper at, that's running the Y North. They're ready to go. Their, their comment is, first of all, they're over, they're underspaced for what they need in Alaska. They're trying to get a building program, when I say trying. It would make them so much easier to operate down there when they have a project up here. And they basically will run the project. And uh, he's excited. And then basically the two people that we can name that we feel comfortable enough that, and there's many more, you can't believe it. You just, you just cannot believe the people that are ready to go with this thing. And like Lori said, we've only been at this nine months. But I, I think we've really done the girls have done the homework because they know the education thing. I'm just the guy sitting here on an elevated chair. <laughs> <laughs> Not to my liking. But I mean, they, uh, they basically know what to do. Then it is just putting the pieces together. And I'm telling you, we got, we got the pieces. Any questions? Mary Lynn, did you have any comments to add? Or we can take... For me, I think the biggest thing is I, I've become um, keenly aware that as we grow our communities, we can no longer keep stepping on each other and trying to be able to garner the resources that are getting slimmer and slimmer. <clears throat> so I think that this is, this is an opportunity for us to really start to say, you know what, maybe we can do some joint ventures. And instead of you know, squashing one person's ideas <laughs> and one person's dreams or an entity's ideas and an entity's dreams because of a lack of finances, by collaborating and, and forming partnerships, we can compound the joys and the successes that we can have. Um, truly, we started off looking at a teen center. And then as we started looking at the opportunities to be able to bridge and, and collaborate with other resources, um, you, you look at a senior citizen person coming in for lunch and staying as a mentor, and it just it grows and grows and grows. And I just think that this is our chance to be able to do something really magnificent to become a stellar, um, a stellar community that says, we're going to join hands and do something together instead of all trying to pull away from each other. Thank you. And then board members, any questions or comments? I is this going to affect the uh, extension of the YMCA? We're talking about a branch. We don't know that yet. don't know that yet, but no. That sure sounds. You go to the you go to the north on uh, YMC North, and if you go in there, of course, you notice that half the kids are from home and half of them are from Alaska. Or whenever you go there, it's like that. It seems like a logical step to me. And I, if anything I can do to help, or, or if you need my help to make a phone call or anything, make sure to give me a call. But it makes perfect sense. The next step, the next step is to to bring something like that to home, and because. They're ready to go down there. I mean, you can tell it's the half the population is it's overcrowded, and half the population are homeless kids and homeless adults. And uh, I go in there all the time, and it's always full of homeless people. It feels like a homeless facility sometimes. You know? <laughs> Bill Soper has actually said half of their kids are from right here. Oh yeah. And he says, now I'm speaking positive. When this happens, 
it's going to branch out to, I mean, you've got Trumple, you've got Galesville. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they'd appreciate something closer. And they know from a business point of the why that just expands their wheel. All this, all we got here is we just got spokes on the wheel. And they know when this thing comes on board, it's just going to explode. And in our vision here is to make this school district the best school district in the state. And we're going to, and we're going to do it. <laughs> Other questions, comments? I, I just, it's really hard to watch you three and you look like you're going to burst <laughs> and not, not just want to burst with you because it's, it, unless I'm really missing something, it's like a no brainer. It's fantastic in so many ways. And when you talk about um, having a component of elderly, um, working together with young kids and and a, a mental health component with Gunderson it's like why did this not happen years ago I mean it's wonderful I almost it almost <laughs> this is awesome this is this is so it's, it's wonderful we're not even telling you half of it I know and that's the best part because you all look like you just almost have to have duct tape on your mouth to keep all the wonderful comments in that you can't because tell us we've yet had, so we've had people say we're on board but okay the two people that I mentioned are on board and they says go for it use our mm -hmm. name we can take that times tenfold that's just fantastic we hear, we hear what you're not saying. <laughs> <laughs> so. Too enthusiastic thumbs up. That's all I want to say. It's really become fun for me. And, and these, these, the input that these two ladies got in the education. There's a lot of power between those two women. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's for sure. You know, I'll make a comment that I think anybody, whether you're a school board, a business owner, or if you're just whatever, you have to deal with it. You, you got to let the people work that know the subject. Mm -hmm. These ladies know the subject. Oh, when I saw Lori come the first time and talk about it, I thought, you might as well put me on the membership list. That's going to happen now. So, Lori, you asked for two things. Yeah. The, could you reread those? Yep. Yeah. The two things are your consensus to allow us to continue conversations with potential partners who might share the same vision for our youth and our community and to include in those conversations the, the ability to consider potential use of school property that would not impede future, future growth or planning for the school district. So it's not an action item but we are they are looking for consensus and I'm seeing head shaking yes and so that is what I would determine as a consensus enthusiastically to move forward. I know, um, as you said, when you are dealing with fundraising and fund development, there are things that you need to keep close to you so that you can work out all of those details. <laughs> discussion, obviously, as things progress, they would come back to the board and discuss any of those and work out any of those items that need to be um, worked out. Um, but. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Dan McHugh, if there's one thing he has, it's his word. And he has said this is going to happen. And I've heard that in the community, that he is good for his word. So I just thank also, too, because the idea is great. We get that. Um, and the identification of the needs, we get that. But we're communities sometimes are not blessed. And I I could get very teary-eyed about this, but where we're not blessed is we don't have three people like you who have passion. So you brought the idea to us, you identified the needs, and you have brought passion. And I can't see how it won't work. So thank you for that and the untold hours that I know you've already put in and are going to put in. So bless you for that. I, I can tell you the funding on the personal end is there. And I have a lot of grandkids and they're in everything today. <laughs> and when you go to these hockey games and basketball games and wherever, all over the state, I take notice of looking at plaques. <laughs> and all that is is just people getting people made motivated yeah. to do something because they're there for the community. Yeah. I just, thank you. <laughs> just just go down to the just go down to the ice rink in Alaska. I was just there yesterday. Yeah. And I was had my little notepad out and I was writing a guy come up to me and he says, he said, what are you doing? You're going to look at how much money you're going to donate up here? And I <laughs> says, nope. 
He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, just take the pictures with your iPhone. <laughs> yeah. That's why I got these two yeah. 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 You can't just do anything with the computer technology. <laughs> but thank you. I hope this is sufficient for what you were um, looking for this evening. Thank, thank you. you and much. let us know if there is anything we can do yeah. to let me know assist mm -hmm. you. So, yeah. Thank you. And congratulations. Oh my gosh, it's not every day you get presented with that opportunity. Um, so don't we live in a great community? We yes, do. we do. So then moving on to some more routine sorts of reports and discussion, pupil services at anticipated spaces for open enrollment students. How are they gonna follow that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's gonna come on up then. Give it a shot. As Julie makes her way. Um, <laughs> In the board packet, you had um, this is just being presented tonight, but um, and Julie will probably restate some of this again by state statute and board policy. We we need to look at what we are anticipating for uh, space with open enrollment requests from our non-residents. This is a this is a difficult um, issue for I know for us in planning this because we've had a history. We're we're open and our doors are open and so this is a um, uh, we'll remind you a couple times probably before this is over that we're open um, we and uh, you're gonna see we're gonna talk you through what you see here uh, we have one correction to make already I know that was brought to my attention before the board meeting started but we'll talk our way through and then you ask questions and so that when we <clears throat> our goal here is that when you come back on January 28th, this will be on the consent agenda and uh, for you to approve, okay? Julie, you wanna get us started and show them or talk them through what, what was included anyway? Absolutely. Um, what you see here is a chart um, and the reason for this chart is that by state statute, we are to determine every year how many spaces we have available for families who wish to open enroll their children into our district. So uh, let me just walk you through this, uh, this chart. Way to the far left, you'll see our grade levels. I began with 4K all the way through 12. The reported enrollment in the next column is our actual third Friday count from this year. The third column then is our projected enrollment, what we're projecting for uh, next year. I then included our current sections per grade level through the middle school. Um, and here is where, where there's a mistake, and I want to clarify right away. Um, we, have, we currently have 15 um, sections at kindergarten, and across you'll see 230 at 20 per section, 12. That 12 should still be a 15. The mistake that, that I made there was that I rolled the 4K forward instead of taking an average of the current K1 and 2. So if you average kindergarten, first and second grade, you'll see they still average out to about 290, and the number that you see there is 230. So we could anticipate still that there would be 15 sections at kindergarten. So that's the mistake. So if you just cross out that 12 and make it a 15, um, that makes that a little clearer. Um, that also then equates to 80 when you look at the anticipated number of sections towards the bottom there. Um, in the middle then, you see the current um, number of sections, and then you also see projected number of sections. Those are based on our projected enrollment and maximizing the number of students per section based on our district guidelines. That's why I included the class size guidelines there. So if we did that, you see the numbers down the right-hand side for um, all the way through middle school. Now, I caution you on the last four numbers there where you see the 1300. Right now, with our current class sizes at middle school, our current sections of 10, we are at 28. So it does not mean that we wouldn't accept open enrolled students at middle school. We, we consider all open enroll applications and we pretty much accept 
um, any open enroll applications. What it means is that we might have some additional sections to add. Um, if we have numbers of students that reflect we need, we need more sections. Um, we've left the high school open. Um, we believe there's, there's ample room for any number of high school students who might request open enrollment. Uh, one com the, the comments that you see at the bottom, I, I want to make sure that we fully understand that. Um, the K-5 then, based on the numbers that, that um, we have up there, could result in three additional sections across the district. Anticipated slots then are based on maximizing our class size, so that would mean really filling up all the classes mm -hmm. with our guideline numbers. Again, our intent is that we consider all open enrollment requests at all grade levels. We, are, we aren't just picking and choosing here at all. And then at the elementary, it's, it's important to know that um, when we get requests at the, for elementary, we accept those requests for open enrollment, but we consider the, the school choice separately. So if parents request a certain school, they might, that might have to be looked at and they might not get the school that they choose. Um, again, the middle school and high school numbers, um, I just caution you on those zeros. It doesn't mean that we don't accept students at those levels. We certainly consider all open enrollment requests. So we don't want anybody leaving the room tonight thinking that we're not gonna accept anybody at those grade levels. So please, uh, that's not the case. And if you, I will admit there's some inconsistency between what we have, we have projected K-5 enrollment and actually modified the sections to reflect that and yet you don't see that in the middle school. Um, it, it's, just, it's, it's just not projecting number of sections. I know Mr. Vogler's back there. It's just, it, it's just so different that it makes it very difficult to put it in a chart like we're asked to do. So we possibly uh, could have just, like we did for the high school, left the middle school open. Maybe that, that would be, and we could make that change for um, the 28th as well, that would more accurately reflect. We just, you know, we want to, we want to meet the requirement uh, by statute and our board policy, but this has been a challenge to put together. Are there any questions? Any questions? Is there any point that maybe as our buildings are closer to capacity where you know as we look at those things that we would that you're shaking your head yes that we would consider I mean not that I'm advocating for that because I think we're open is a good um, position to take at this point in time but maybe down the road that could always be a possibility um, but we certainly we have a ways to get there I, I know and again as we look at the middle school um, that's uh, as I met with Mr. Vogler just the other day about uh, the ongoing challenge. We have we have class sizes there that we need to continue to work with, and it's a challenge. But we still want to encourage and invite people to enroll. But to answer your question, uh, yes, that is a possibility. But we don't see that in the immediate future. And that would be something you would talk with the board of. I mean, if in the future that became a situation. I know we've talked as a board about open enrollment at the elementary level of our own students going from their assigned district to others and the impact that's had on some of those, especially at the elementary level, requiring <coughs> additional sections. And so as Julie said this year, especially in the past, we haven't maybe done that as much, but if someone open enrolls into our district, they may not get the school they asked for because of that, because they're that discussion that took place last fall or maybe even the fall before when we were discussing those things and just kind of a new different perspective maybe as we're looking at this so. and we are to uh, accept these or we we're going to ask you to take action on this at the next board meeting okay. mm -hmm. would you still keep the zeros in there in that column to I'm, take action or i'm open for comments feedback on that um, and i'm thinking right now I, I certainly could support making those open at this time 
I think just if something came back later on that the what's written should reflect what we were going to yeah. do and if we're going to okay. open them otherwise if we're only going to allow for three you know then we should have okay. them there but if not then I would you could anticipate we'll be making that change then. Okay. thank you okay. thank you thank you and then the next item is the business services WRS unfunded liability. Mr. Austin. <coughs> okay, good evening everyone. Um, some tough acts to follow, but I'll try to bring uh, an exciting opportunity to you tonight. Um, this is a report item only, looking for future approval by, uh, by the board um, coming at the end of January. But, uh, okay, so the, the topic tonight is the Wisconsin Retirement System Unfunded Liability Advance Payment that I'm seeking. Um, our district, just to provide a little history on this, uh, like many in Wisconsin, has a prior service liability or loan with the WRS to cover the period prior to us joining or for employees prior service credits earned. So the Wisconsin retirement system is the retirement plan for our employees here in the district and we have a loan balance with them that we are paying off monthly with our regular remittances on employees behalf. So this liability or loan has a high in interest rate of approximately 7.2% the interest rate is assessed on an annual basis on our balance as of 1231. So some districts have taken out loans or issued bonds to pay off their balances while others have continued to pay the balance down through monthly remittances. We have chosen the latter. In the current interest rate environment coupled with a lower liability balance, our liability balance is approximately 250,000 at this point in time. Um, to 260 as of 1231 so it would be an advantageous to pay off the liab liability balance in full this January if we paid off in full this January we avoid the interest that is assessed on that 1231 balance so what I would be recommending is to pay off the remaining liability we already have a portion budgeted this current fiscal period approximately 70,000 budgeted this year to pay toward that liability balance or that loan. The rest of it would come from an advance funding from next year's budget. So what would be the benefit of that? We would avoid approximately $26,000 worth of interest by making an advance payment from next year's budget to pay this down this year. Remember, we already have some budgeted for this this year, approximately 70. So we would be advancing the remaining portion from next year's budget to pay that off. So avoid $26,000 worth of interest. We would then maximize our expenditures for 1213. And what I mean by that is um, right now we've got some one-time expenditures planned for 1213. Well, with the technology project underway, that's a big project. Are we able to expend that project fully out with the remaining months that we have available in 1213, hopefully we can. But if we can't, this would be a, another way to spend down and fulfill our total expenditure budget this year, maximizing our shared cost for next year. Okay, remember, every dollar we spend this year, we get back in aid the following year. This will also re relieve our cash flow obligations imposed by the prior service liability. Remember, we make monthly remittances on this. By paying that balance off in full, it relieves us from those monthly obligations going forward. We can decide what we want to do with those monthly payments in the future. Do we want to set those aside like we did with the 4K program, repay that fund balance back? And it's entirely up to the board. <coughs> So our return on invested funds at this point in time, what we have in our cash reserves is very minimal. We receive anywhere from 20 to 30 basis points on that, which is a far cry from the 7.2% interest that we pay on this balance. So two primary reasons 
the interest rate environment, the spread between what we generate on our cash invested and the interest rate charged on our liability balance and the fact that we have approximately $250,000 less, we can take this out of our cash flow balance right now without impacting our cash flow in the sense that we wouldn't have to borrow externally in the future either. We've built our cash flow or our cash balance up to a point where we can pay this out of cash balance without jeopardizing and forcing us to borrow externally. Does anybody have any questions on this? Any questions? I just, a couple as I read the issue paper and, and conceptually this is, I mean to me it seems to be a pretty straightforward we should do this type of a thing, but as I read, uh, I guess uh, number two, the advanced funding would, I'm just a little concerned here, excuse me, um, yes, the advanced funding would result approximately 180,000 may result in using fund balance or spending down unspent one-time allocations, e.g. technology. It makes me a little bit nervous that it's that's so open-ended right. as opposed to it sounds like you're advocating fund balance, but in the issue paper it says we might use other unspent one-time allocations such as technology. Sure. And I think as a board we may want to give a little more direction as to use fund balance or not use fund balance at that time. And then the next item here talks about the repayment of it. Again, in the issue paper it kind of says, well, the, 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 the board has been diligent in paying back but will be left to the discretion of the board whether they want to pay it back, if I read that correctly as well. So there's no Right. guarantee of repayment back on that as well and I, I think those are maybe a couple issues that as a board we should decide up front on mm -hmm. um, both of those items that in the issue paper to me are a little <clears throat> unclear and maybe we'd want to clarify both of those points in uh, addressing this resolution sure very good points other comments or questions I just have one can you clarify for me if we have 70, is it 70, 74? Sorry, I can't bring mine up. Approximately. 70, approximately 70 this year in the budget, and but yet we have 250. The additional amount, was that all in the 2013-14 budget? And if so, why was that so much higher next year <coughs> than it was this year? So we have approximately 70,000 budgeted for 12-13. Mm -hmm portion of the 180 would be budgeted next year. We have to pay that. That's, that's an obligation in the 13-14 budget. We wouldn't fully pay off um, the, I don't know if this would help, we wouldn't be able to fully pay that off in 13-14. It would actually go into the next fiscal period as well. So as a result, it would span two more fiscal periods after this year. Because that interest is assessed in January on the balance in December, we would have two interest assessments charged to that. One for approximately 18,000 this January and another one for 8,600 come next January in 2014. So it, it really spans three fiscal periods at this point in time. Thank you, I missed that. And so then just for example, to kind of go along with that point, if we were to, coming back to what I said earlier, kind of modify number two to say we're going to use the fund balance, then number three would say something like, and we would pay that back over the next three years to kind of stay on that same payment cycle that we have, have been on. Is that? We, we could be doing that, yes. And that would keep us on about the same payment cycle without changing a real cash flow to the district. That would be correct and save money on top of that. And save a lot of money on top yes. of that. If we had resources at the end of the year, so we didn't have to take it out of the reserve fund, mm -hmm. then would you be advocating we use those, uh, those resources left so there really wouldn't be anything to pay back? If, if we had the resources available as of 630 and we decided to make mm -hmm. that payment, Unfortunately, because they assessed the interest in January, mm -hmm. we'd still have the 17000 or almost $18,000 interest payment tagged on top of that, even though we would remit that full balance payment come June. 
But so what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is in the past we've had um, year end our year end numbers yep. have been to the black and not to the red. Right. And and maybe even a little bit more in the positive column. Correct. So instead of having to take it out, we may have positive funds left at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm hearing is part of this is to get out of that cycle of repaying. If we don't have to repay it, if we have funds available that aren't in the reserve fund, mm -hmm. then there wouldn't be a need to pay it back. But if we do have to take, maybe even if it's half of it, but what we would take out of the reserve fund, we would, with the understanding, we would pay that back. But other, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the expectation isn't that everything left over necessarily goes into the reserve fund. You know what I'm saying is yes. what we've budgeted. Jay. May I? Yeah. So I, I, this is the same conversation that Jason and I and Dale had. And so what you're saying in number two, I, I understand. It's, it's vague. It presents at least two options. And, and President Hancock's talking about potentially a third. And um, while we want to pay this off now, we don't know exactly which of the methods will be most advantageous to the district. We do know that as a fallback position, no matter what happens, we can fully pay it out of the fund balance and still be ahead on this deal. But wanted to have, well, and that's why it's vague, wanted to have some options available so that if the technology infrastructure funding did not get done this year, we could say, you know what, we'll just use the portion of that money this year to pay this off and then the money that we would have finished in the black we'll use to pay for technology in the next year. So there's all kinds of options. Um, getting too specific, well, we right. could be very specific in this and then we could come back to the board and say, hey, end of the year, we want to do things a little bit differently, we could inform you. Or you could say, yes, we know that there's a, try, there's gonna be an absolute way to pay this out of fund balance and if you guys can find up some better strategy, then go for it. It's whatever you're comfortable with, but yeah. you should let us know if you want something specific. I, I'm just concerned. Maybe I'm a little sensitive when I read this. The uh, IE technology, knowing how you know troubled we are in upgrading that, yeah. maybe that just got me hypersensitive that I was going to see money being repurposed nope. that maybe we weren't intending to have happen here. That's a good clarification for us here tonight because that is not the that. intent, and I would not want anyone to be listening to this meeting and nope. thinking that or. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's not the intent at all. It's just to maximize our expenditures this year, continue to fund you know the technology yeah. like it was budgeted and like it was approved in the fall. So, so what I'm hearing is that it sounds like, and this is coming back at the next meeting, correct? Correct. That there's a, you know this this is a good idea. It's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. However, th probably the recommendation is that at toward the end of the year you may have more concrete. Um, specifics about where those funds are actually coming from that you would share with the board um, with the understanding I think it's pretty loud and clear that if we take money out of the reserve fund that I think the board has always been pretty consistent that the expectation is that that be repaid or if you take funds from another something designated like the technology funds that those but if there are maybe um, HR or some more gen general fund kind of things left that those then would just be utilized to to, to do that. So I think that we can recraft this so that it says something closer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think I'm seeing some heads, so that's good. All right, thank you, Jason. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So then moving on, board reports and discussion. I'll call upon the board members in the order of the roll call and ask you to present any comments or committee reports. Um, Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, I attended the Personnel and Governance Committee meeting last Wednesday um, along with Mrs. Hancock and I will let you report on that as you are the chairperson. Um, I will not be at the Student Achievement and Learning Committee meeting next Monday because I will be at the Presidential Inauguration in Washington, D.C. So we can assign you lots of duties? <laughs> A lot of what? Duties. I don't think so. <laughs> so but. Um, and that's all I have. Okay, Mrs. Mayor. <clears throat> no, um, SALC meets on the 21st, and so then I'll report about that. And later on, we'll talk about um, the WASB convention coming up to see what your input is on that. But. Great. Mr. Menninger. 
Uh, just a couple of quick things tonight. Well, it seems like a long time since we've met, so Happy New Year to everybody, um, as it has been, and welcome certainly back to the school year. Lots of great things going on, and really, again, tonight, just we hear some great things, just continues to make you feel really good about home and schools. Um, and I know lots of good things going on all the way around, and it is still winter time, so uh, get out uh, in the gyms on these cold winter nights or at the rinks or whatever, and uh, cheer on Holman. Thank you. Um, i got to find my list again here. Sorry, Kari, Mrs. Treadway, sorry. I was just going to start talking, but I thought I'd wait. <laughs> Um, congratulations again to Roger King and thank you to the happy group and I'm fully supportive as the rest of the board is and um, excited to hear and anxious to hear more results down the road. We do have a building and grounds meeting on the 28th and I think that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Schwabenbauer. Uh, first I'd like to start off by saying congratulations to Holman Decca. They had their regional competition this Saturday, I believe, and I know many of them went on to state. I think almost all of them did, actually, so it was <laughs> very exciting for them. Um, also, what's still in the works is uh, Miss Mayor and I are trying to set up a time to meet with Mr. O for um, the board outreach project. Um, he hasn't gotten back to me yet, though, okay. so we'll I, get her done. sounds good. <laughs> um, also, uh, I wanted to say congratulations to Mr. King again for the um, for all the success that they've had and the awards that he's received. And two, I just wanted to comment on the presentation that Ms. Kessler, Ms. Mrs. Kessler gave earlier. And I wanted to say that everybody at school absolutely loves that woman. I mean. <laughs> Not just at school. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere. She's yeah, just, do too. yeah, an absolutely amazing person. And I am so excited to come back in the future and see all of the great things that our district has done. It's very exciting. Thank you. Mr. Dunlap. And I agree with the comment about Lori Kessler, too. As a, my daughter's graduated many years ago in the 90s, but I still felt like when, she, when I talked to her about those, those kids, that, that she was their best friend. And uh, she made every parent feel like their, their student was, their, was her best friend and she was, had the better, their best interest at heart. And, and I just love that woman as well. Yep. Uh, congratulations to Mr. King. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, it, I, it just seems like yesterday I was saying to myself how odd to look to see zero zero on a Letterman's jacket. <laughs> and there, there it's got, you know, one five out of it. It, it, it goes by so fast. Uh, we have a finance committee meeting next Monday, and uh, you're all welcome to come by and discuss the budget updating we'll be doing if you'd like to come. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gittens? Yeah, I got a letter back from the Polar Express and then they thank me for <coughs> contributing to, to their success. This is the entrepreneurial group that, mm -hmm. and I think entrepreneurial group should be a very good correlation to, to go with Mr. McHugh's articulation with the people of this community and the, the school itself. So they, they said uh, thank you very much for allowing us to sell your items in our store. We are very grateful at your contribution for making our store a success. We could not have done it without your help. Because of your generous contributions, our store was able to make a family holiday wish come true. Thank you very much. Sincerely, the Polar Express team. Now, this, this is articulation. This is what we need. That's nice. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. You know, we, two examples, the collaborative community collaboration and, and that just two th and Mr. Kane three things that make our district yeah. so um, successful and powerful and I, I also echo the comments of, regarding the community collaboration I think as we hear people's response to some of the violence that's happened and gun control and gun issues and gun legislation may be one part of it or not whatever they decide to do on that but I really see that what we're trying to do is tackle some of the difficult issues that people are afraid of. And, uh, you know, you keep hearing them say it's too big, it, it can't be responded to. And I think in our own little way, this th group of three and the people that are all behind them are, are trying to tackle that issue and have been trying to tackle that issue of making all of our students feel good about themselves and, and one way or another, whether it's during the day or after hours. So. Thank you for your support on that. 
And then the, the uh, Personnel and Governance Committee did meet and we continued to discuss insurance and um, Mr. Clark and Mrs. Wavra have been discussing some options with us and are looking at um, continuing with the committee to further discuss things that we're seeing happening across the country, wellness initiatives, those sorts of things, um, and are looking to include a group of stakeholders in their discussion as they move forward on that, and so we appreciate that. We also have some policies that will be coming to you from that committee, and then also we've discussed a, a little bit as a board issues related to time worked and w how is that recognized and people who have had um, extended contracts over um, a number of years and how to respond to that. So we've got a solution that we're working on for that. I think that meets the needs of the district and the individuals um, and some of the comments of the board, although we may be seeing a further and larger discussion on that um, in the future. As you know, sometimes when you open something up, it, it opens a lot of other doors and issues up, and so um, you know we may be discussing that in the future. But that is all that I have. I would just note that you, um, I don't have anything in, under correspondence in our, but our meeting schedule upcoming, as uh, Mrs. Mayor said, there is the School Board Association meeting. Mm -hmm. We meet on January 28th, February 11th, and the 25th, and March 11th. March, wow. <laughs> so, um, the next item on the agenda is school board verification of candidacy and ballot order. And I would just note that the um, candidates for the April 2nd board election are Lisa Collins, Tim Menninger, and Kari Tread Treadway. The order that the names are to appear on the ballot need to be drawn. And so we will do this at this time. And Mrs. Jay Gazinski, if you could hold this, and actually Mr. Gittins, why don't you take it over to Mr. Gittins and he will draw, and then this will be the order. So just draw one at a time, and then Christina will take the name, I think it's inside an envelope. Mm -hmm. And so that is the, would you open that? And Number then, one on the ballot is? Liza Collins. Okay. Lisa. Lisa, Lisa Collins. Okay. Name number two. Name number two. Number two is Kari Treadway. Kari Treadway. And then hopefully the name in there is Tim <laughs> Menninger. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that is the order that the, the names will appear on the ballot. Then moving on to the Wisconsin Association of School Board Resolutions. Mrs. Mayor, did you have any comments or questions? My question for all of you is, uh, you know that there will be <coughs> voting on several resolutions, and you all received copies of those resolutions, and I've read them and highlighted them and looked at what um, WASB is recommending. My question for you is, do you have input for me? with specific resolutions, um, or do you just want to send me off and um, trust me? <laughs> oh, no, you can't be trusted. Uh, Gary wants to trust me, but the rest of you? <laughs> that's what we've done every year, I think. Yep. I think every single year I can remember okay. that. And I was like a newbie, so I thought, I want to make sure I do want to check on protocol yeah. for this. So there are some, actually, I think there are some incredible resolutions that I think politically will will help us as a school board if they all pass and I'm assuming in in years past once a resolution comes up is it kind of a given that it passes oh, no. or not oh no you I think you're going to the orientation the evening before yes because I am oftentimes mm -hmm. this is the greatest display and Mr. King is in here of parliamentary procedure uh, okay. and People who have an opportunity, we're all elected, you know, yep. and they have that opportunity to speak in front of leaders of, you know, across the state of all the districts. So 400 and some districts, there are 400 and some okay. people with microphones while wanting to speak. It's pretty interesting. Wow. So very rarely do they all pass with, without any um, hitches, huh? amendments and those <laughs> sorts of things. Okay. So the, um, what you'll find is some discussion that takes place there. Um, will be very beneficial to you and there is a perspective of small schools versus large schools although we try to remind ourselves that it's not pitting people or school districts against each other declining enrollment versus growing enrollment some of the schools 
will be there that have the vouchers and receive vouchers versus schools that don't support those kind of things. And so it's the, so it will be very interesting. You'll, and if you go to the orientation, the committee that puts these forward will explain their rationale for putting them forward. And then what these do then is it guides the Wisconsin WASB in how they approach the legislators. And sometimes they think things that they think are a, an easy thing don't get passed for a variety of reasons. So. Thank you for that input. Well, I'm really looking forward um, to going and representing you. And I've told some of you before, I'm like an information nerd. I love reading all, I've read every word of every packet I received and I just enjoy reading that and seeing what's coming up. So, okay. Yeah, Thanks thank a lot you. for that input. Okay, and then under school board administrative rules, discussion and review, we have facilities and transportation um, security. And I think this is the only one of the policies that we hadn't brought here as a group. Is that, because I think we looked at three of them, didn't we? Right, and this is, we need this, personal and governance, we need this one for our next meeting as well because earlier this year, uh, we presented 771 video cameras on buses for your philosophical review and then it went to committee and we haven't gotten to that because we now believe we want to embed that policy into this one. We think that there's a good fit there and so um, we thought we better bring this to you tonight just for again that first review by you give any for you to give any specific direction to the committee but just know that we plan to work administratively and then for the committee to take the video cameras on bus policy and insert that into this one to make one that's the plan so any questions or comments about those just policies? just a question and, and maybe I shouldn't answer it because it just might create more work for me but um, <laughs> Buildings and Grounds Committee would seem, I just was wondering why that wasn't with the Building and Grounds Committee versus Personnel and Governance. Excellent question. I'd be open for other, uh, excellent question. This, I think this has evolved, you know, when we first formed the committees, we, we looked at policies and um, I think the video camera one, when we started thinking about bringing, we needed something that talk more specifically about in schools. And we start thinking about students specifically, not that that shouldn't be the thing on buses as well. And so I, I think it was hard to place it specifically. And so some of those then fell kind of within what formerly we had the Committee of the Whole, but now personnel and governance. I would Again, I don't want to speak for the different chairs of the committees. Um, that certainly can be a place for it as well. Um, because we are talking, I think, buildings and grounds. You do, already there's been discussion about security, and um, which does impact our facilities as well. So open for additional thoughts, or maybe look to um, chairs. Uh, direction on that I think we were just looking at it because it was on our list but yeah. certainly as you say Tim it makes sense to come to that I, facilities committee I, I just Buildings thought I'd ask the committee. question I probably should defer any further to the chair of that committee and <laughs> before I, think, I create more work I think the committee would welcome that and I think yeah. John Daly would have good input yeah. and I know we've already started we have put some thought already in administratively into some recommendations for this so um, I believe there have been some other policies that we've reviewed that actually could be worked on by one group and then referred to another committee so that you make sure you get that balanced perspective but as Dr. Carlson's implying that from the administrative level uh, it doesn't matter what I know John does a lot of work with the facilities and buildings and grounds committee but um, his input would not be overlooked even though this was you know, a governance issue under the personnel and governance committee. So you think that's why is it was a governance issue? Yeah, I don't think it was so much a personnel issue as it was a governance which is, you know, I think we often think of that as personnel committee but really it deals <laughs> with uh, broader governance issues as well. But I hear what you're saying in transportation and uh, buildings and grounds and students 
Could it, could it be sought? Could it be? So it, it, it was a challenge, I'm sure. So administratively, we're certainly open on a recommendation. If, if the board wants to assign that to buildings and grounds, that would be mm -hmm. Certainly supportive of that, or I'm seeing consensus head shaking. We're just going to consent all night, so I think that <laughs> makes sense. Unless there's something more compelling, and if there is, then it certainly could come to us, as Jay indicated. Um, but sure, let's okay. the facilities and transportation security to buildings and grounds committee. And um, any comments about specifically moving that that video cameras part of it into there? Yes. Then moving on to consent items, I would just note there are two consent items this evening. Um, first, the personnel report and financial claims and accounts. Um, at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent items as presented, unless someone would like to separate them. Motion to uh, motion, mo motion has been made to approve consent items as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion or questions? I just have a question about the unpaid leave. Do we still, I know in the past with the um, union contracts, we always had a um, provision in there um, regarding unpaid leave and how often unpaid leave could be taken every like five years so many days every so many years. Do we still have that provision? Do we not? Thank you, Melissa. Sorry, kind of a pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> um, within the collective bargaining agreements, it was specifically defined certain groups could take up to a one year's leave of absence for child rearing purposes or um, educational purposes. And under the handbook, we've combined all of the CBA language and made just one section pertaining to unpaid leave. So any requests for unpaid leave, whether it's because you need an unpaid day because you've exhausted your leave for the year and mm -hmm. perhaps something emergency has come up and you need an unpaid day, that would fall under that language. Um, medical purposes, we've actually added additional language for medical. You can get up to two years now um, for medical leave under the unpaid leave, child rearing. Um, so there are still those um, certain year long things that you can take and request an unpaid leave what of like absence vacations? for. Um, the, yeah, I think, are you thinking of the once in a lifetime opportunity yeah. type language? Um, yes, I believe there is some exclusion in there that does provide for, it, it really encompasses all unpaid leave requests, so. Okay. Would you say, since you're there, the numbers, it, it just seemed high to me too. That they yeah, the numbers, it. and the reason you see them all on there now is because before they, they seem to come after the fact, and now the language requires a notice. Um, so it seems high, this um, personnel report. A lot of them are, for Christmas, we got vacation to wherever they're going. So um, there were a lot of those that came in right after we came back from break. So, um, and there's been a lot of, I think, a higher number of illnesses as well. So. Um, we're seeing some of those unpaid days coming in sooner than we have in the past. But like, is a, is a person allowed to take seven unpaid days for vacation? That's what I'm noticing if, on the personnel report. That's yeah, if they've exhausted their personal days, um, then they can request the unpaid leave for... And how often is that, that they can take like seven days for vacation unpaid? Um, there's no exclusions in the handbook. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Like, I know in the past it had been... They every five years or once every seven right. years. Right, and we have not written any exclusions okay. into the handbook. Okay, that was a, what I was wondering. So, yep. okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against nay. Motion passes. Then executive session. Mrs. Treadway. I move we, that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of reviewing the district administrator's performance evaluation and contract renewal for administrators and supervisors. Okay, and then roll call. Anita Jacobinski? Yes. 
State Mayor? Yes. The Mayor? Yes. Archibald, right, yes. Gary Dunlap? Yes. <laughs> Joe Gittins? Yep. And Joe Hancock? Yes. 